are two tools that are directly related to the timber trade and, and really specifically to woodland because this is a, a girthing tape which you see you can't measure in the normal way off it but you use it to get take the, the circumference of a tree and then using the quarter girth method uh, you can find out what the volume of the tree would be which is the, the quarter girth plus the height and if your arms aren't long enough this is called either a girthing sword um, or something called something called a timber needle which will you can use to extend your arm to stretch round the tree to be able to bring your tape and the tape this is this tape has lost its its um, case it would have normally been in a leather case uh, like any long measuring tape um, this is a, a book called um, the rule book which uh, I wrote um, and um, which I started with my late husband uh, but finished and um, the, one of the chapters uh, covers um, the timber trade and this is you can see um, the girthing sword and a timber calipers from the W.S. Stanley catalogue. Uh, W.S. Stanley were a rule and, and uh, drawing instrument maker, not, not the plane maker. Uh, and he, they were in, worked in London. This is a little collection of saw sets. Uh, w and C Wynne were Birmingham steel toy makers. Now, toy makers were not people who made children's playthings. It's a misconception. Um, they actually, anything that was small and usually utilitarian, in Birmingham was called a toy and you would have steel toy makers, you'd have tortoiseshell toy makers, you had silver toy makers, um, any, any, you'd had gold toy makers, so they were all making sm small items in their specific, but steel toy makers are the most common. W&C Wynne started in uh, eight, uh, 1797 um, and it was the C and were Cornelius and William and they actually took over from their father who was a buckle maker. And when buckles, which that's in shoe buckles, went out of fashion, they started finding other things to make. They produced wonderful pattern books. The wonderful thing about them was that they showed everything they made in every size. They would have, and they were full size, so you could put your item that you have on top of the actual item some of these, if their items are too big, they'll maybe be half size or quarter size, but a lot of them were the items were actually full size. These are saw sets for um, all sorts of different saws. These big heavy ones, they would be for pit saws. Um, you've got much finer ones like this one would be for uh, hand saws. Now a saw, a saw set is used when you, after you've sharpened you, the teeth of a saw, which you will do with a saw file, which is a little triangular file. The teeth aren't parallel to the blade, <laughs> they tend to be slightly offset. So you get that to get it through the wood and you end up with the kerf. And these were used, these simple ones, you would just put them on the blade and you just went down setting the teeth each way. And obviously a lot of tool makers were very inventive so they started thinking of easier ways to doing this. So they developed ones that were plier style. This was uh, is something called a morals saw set, and this was an American style. And you might think that this was sort of a rel relatively recent invention, but actually this was pre-1890 that they had made, they were starting to be inventive enough to make. And again, this has a little um, thing that goes there, which goes, so it, pushes against each one and then they got a bit more sophisticated and this was probably again more likely for a pit saw you'd put it on there and you'd actually hammer this down so all of these were available before 1900 but originally they didn't have the prices in them because the books would be sent to the retailers to the ironmongers and they would show the patterns to their customers they would then order what the customers wanted. So it was sort of custom made, I mean, not quite, but it would be, they would order, they wouldn't just buy stuff in and have it all in stock. They would order what they needed. 
and they obviously didn't want their customers to know what they had to pay for them because the prices, the price list is, is the, the wholesale price, not the retail price. So they didn't come with prices in them. You would get your, cat, your pattern book from your manu the manufacturer and you were never allowed to have the next one until you'd sent back the old one because the manufacturers didn't want these full-size pattern books kicking around for other people to copy their tools. If you buy them on eBay, you, there are a couple of specialist tool auctioneers. Um, you buy them at antique fairs, and you need to. The, the way to start is to learn about them, because um, uh, you, so you need to know, you know, what you're collecting. There are uh, quite a number of collectors of, of tool collecting books, which are all wonderful resources. You just go around looking for the stuff and try and find out as much as you can about it. I'm very limited in what I collect these days. I collect rules and I keep those in a chest which I think originally probably had birds eggs or butterflies or something like that. So there's a lot of little thin drawers that are perfect for storing rules so I, I keep those. And I collect W&C Win tools partly because after my husband died in, two, in uh, 2001, the early American Industries, which I belong to, which is the American equivalent of the Tools and Trades History Society, um, set up a memorial fund because Mark had, had the idea it would have been fun to reprint one of these catalogues from Salem and, and they said we could do that. And we reprinted the 1820 Wynn catalogue in his memory. So I started collecting W&C Wynn tools. One time I was visiting my father and he had a chest he used to keep our family documents in it. And I suddenly realized, looking at this chest, that it was a Wynn gentleman's tool chest. So I got the tool chest and I keep my Wynn tool, or my Wynn tools in a W&C Wynn gentleman's tool chest.